Welcome to the deep dive. You know, there's this uh, persistent challenge, right? Parasitic infections, they affect our pets, they affect us. It's a huge public health issue. Absolutely. And finding treatments that really work is just crucial. Exactly. So our mission today is simple. We're going to do a deep dive, really get into the weeds on two antiparasitic drugs. You hear a lot about fenbenazole and ivermectin. We're using the source material you shared to kind of uh, distill it all down. Precisely. We'll synthesize the key facts, look at how they work, their approved uses, off-label stuff too. Oh, yeah. And even some, well, surprising research areas that are getting attention. The goal is to give you a really solid, well-rounded understanding. Okay, sounds good. Let's start with fenbendazole. The material puts it right up front, broad spectrum anthelmintic, so a dewormer. Right, and it's in the benzimazole class of drugs. That's its family. So how does it actually you know, do what it does? What's the science? Well, it's quite interesting how it works. It's not just about poisoning the parasite directly. The benzimazole goes after their internal structure. Asset. It stops the formation of microtubules in the parasite cells. Think of microtubules as like uh, internal scaffolding. Essential building blocks. Uh -huh. So by disrupting these, fimbendazole basically stops the parasite from building, moving, even absorbing nutrients. They essentially starve or fall apart from within. Wow. So it cripples them internally. That sounds pretty fundamental. It is. It makes it harder for parasites to develop resistance quickly compared to some other mechanisms. Got it. So it's main job, the common uses, primarily animals, right? Yes. Treating a whole range of internal parasites in animals, your source lists, Roundworms, hookworms, whipworms, tapeworms, pretty common issues in pets and livestock. But you know, what really jumped out at me in the material beyond the animal use mm -hmm. was the mention of off-label use in humans for parasites mm -hmm. and even this uh, early research into cancer treatment potential. That was yeah. unexpected. It's definitely an area generating buzz, though it's still very preliminary, especially the cancer link. And just practically, the source mentions doses like 150 milligram, or Mentel 500 milligrams, 222 milligrams, 444 milligram tablets. Those are the typical forms. Right. And if we look at the pros and cons summarized in the material. Yeah, let's do that. The pros are definitely, it's broad action against many worms. It's generally safe for most animals and side effects tend to be minimal. Okay, sounds good so far. But the cons, well, it usually needs multiple doses to fully clear an infection. That's a key thing. Right, not always a one-shot deal. Exactly. And it's not effective against every single type of parasite out there. Plus, the big one, primarily for animals. No widespread FDA approval for humans. Okay, that makes sense. So that's fenbendazole, a key tool for animal health. But like you said, it's not the only one. Not at all. The info then shifts to ivermectin, another big name used in both vet and human medicine. Yeah. Belongs to the... Uh, Ivermectin class. Correct. A different family, different way of working. So how does this one operate? Ivermectin targets the parasite's nervous system. It binds to specific channels, these glutamate-gated chloride channels, on their nerve cells. Okay. And what does that do? It basically sources these channels open, messing up the nerve signals. It leads to paralysis. Paralysis. Yeah, paralysis and then death for the parasite. It's a neurotoxic effect, but very targeted towards the parasites. Generally not the host, though there are exceptions. Interesting. Very different approach. Right. And its uses. Also broad. In animals, effective against things like roundworms, but also external parasites, lice, mites. That's a key difference from fenbendazole. Right, external stuff too. And crucially for humans... It does have specific FDA approvals. Okay, what for? For treating werther blindness, that's onchocerciasis, a really serious condition. Also strong galoidiasis, an intestinal worm, and scabies, those skin mites. So established human uses. I know the source also mentioned studies on antiviral properties, like for COVID-19. It did, yes. But it also clearly states the FDA has not recommended it for that. That's a really important context. Absolutely. And the doses mentioned are 3 milligrams, Iverheal 6 milligrams, and 12 milligram tablets. Correct. So weighing the pros and cons for ivermectin. Let's hear them. Pros. Highly effective. Works on both internal and external parasites. Often just a single dose is needed for certain infections, which is convenient. And as we said, FDA approved for specific human uses. Okay. And the downsides? Well, there's a growing concern about resistance in some parasite populations, similar to antibiotic resistance. Ah, uh, yeah. There's also a risk of neurotoxicity, side effects. In certain animals, some dog breeds are particularly sensitive, so careful dosing is vital. Good to know. And like fenbendazole, it doesn't kill all types of worms. No single drug does. Okay. So we've got these two profiles, fenbendazole, ivermectin. 
How do they stack up side by side? What are the really key differences if you're trying to choose? Right. The direct comparison is helpful. Let's break it down based on the factors in your material. Sure. First, spectrum of activity. Okay. Pembenazole, primarily gastrointestinal worms, roundworms, hookworms, whipworms, tapeworms. Inside the gut, mostly. Got it. Ivermectin. Broader. It hits some internal worms, but also those external parasites like lice and mites. So inside and out for ivermectin, mostly inside for fenbendazole. What about effectiveness or maybe like how you use them? Good point. Effectiveness is linked to dosing. Fenbendazole usually needs multiple doses, maybe over several days, a sustained approach. Right. Ivermectin often nails certain infections with a single dose. Potent, quick. Generally, you'd say ivermectin is more powerful against external parasites. While fenbendazole might be preferred for specific gut worms. Exactly. Then there's the big one, human versus animal use. Yeah, we touched and on this And fenbendazole bit. is overwhelmingly an animal drug. Human use is off-label, experimental. Right. Ivermectin has those specific FDA approvals for humans, scabies, river blindness. Yeah, that's a major distinction. Okay. And safety and side effects. How do they compare there? Fenbendazole is generally seen as very well tolerated in animals, minimal issues, but again, limited human data. Right. Ivermectin is generally safe for humans when used as prescribed for its approved conditions. Yeah. But it can have side effects, dizziness, nausea, and in rare cases, or with incorrect high doses, neurotoxicity is a risk. I see. So the source kind of summarizes this into when to choose, right? Yes, it offers practical pointers. Yes. You'd lean towards fenbendazole if, mm -hmm. well, if you're tackling those common intestinal worms, roundworms, whipworms, tapeworms, yeah, okay. or if you're treating animals like dogs, cats, livestock, and want something generally very gentle with few side effects. Makes sense. And you choose ivermectin if. If you need to target external parasites like lice or mites, yeah. maybe along with some internal worms. Right, that broader spectrum. Or, crucially, if you're treating one of those specific human parasitic infections where it's FDA approved, yeah. or if the convenience of a single dose treatment is a major factor for a specific condition it covers. So summing it up, ivermectin seems maybe more versatile overall, especially with the human uses and external parasites. And potentially. But fenbendazole is still a really solid choice for certain key internal parasites in animals. Precisely. It really boils down to the specific parasite, the species being treated animal or human, and the regulatory status. Not one size fits all. Definitely not. Now, let's shift gears to something really fascinating and uh, honestly quite discussed that the source highlights this growing interest in fenbendazole among cancer patients. Yes, that's a significant point in the material. It's a topic generating a lot of online discussion and, well, hope for some. What's driving that interest, according to the source? Why are patients looking at an animal dewormer for cancer? The material points to a few things. One is anecdotal success stories you find online personal accounts can be very compelling, even if they aren't scientific proof. Sure. Another factor is cost. Compared to conventional cancer treatments, fenbendazole is relatively inexpensive. It's a huge factor for many. Absolutely. And then there's the perception, based on its animal use, that it has minimal side effects, at least in the short term. These factors together create a strong pull for some patients looking for alternatives or additions to standard care. I can understand the appeal, but the medical community must have concerns, right? Oh, definitely. And the source outlines these clearly. The biggest one is the lack of human clinical trials. There just isn't robust, large-scale data showing it works safely and effectively for cancer in humans. That's a critical gap. Huge. Then there's the risk of drug interactions. Fenbendazole might interfere with chemotherapy or other necessary medications, potentially reducing their effectiveness or causing harmful side effects. And think about that. And finally, the inherent risks of self-medication. Getting the dose wrong could lead to toxicity or simply ineffective treatment, which might cause someone to delay or abandon proven therapies. It's a really serious concern. So caution is definitely warranted from the medical side, but is there any actual research or is it purely anecdotal? The material mentions findings for both drugs. There's some early stage research, yes. For fenbendazole, studies suggest it might inhibit cancer cell growth by disrupting those microtubules we talked about earlier. The same mechanism as against parasites. Seems like it, yes. Targeting cell structure. And for ivermectin, there's also preclinical research suggesting it might interfere with cancer cell metabolism, potentially slowing tumor progression. So, some scientific basis for the interest, at least in the lab. Some, yes. But, and the source strongly emphasizes this, these are early findings, promising, maybe. But more clinical trials in humans are absolutely essential before either could ever be recommended for cancer treatment. Right. 
that's the crucial takeaway. Absolutely. And the advice is always, always consult your doctor before considering any off-label use like this. Don't go it alone. Okay. Very important points. Now, moving towards wrapping up, let's cover some practical questions the material addresses, like can you use fenbendazole and ivermectin together? The source says veterinarians might sometimes recommend using them in combination, perhaps for very broad parasite control in animals if multiple types of parasites are suspected. But not something to just do yourself. Definitely not. Yeah. Always needs professional veterinary guidance to assess the need and safety. Okay. And which one is considered safer for humans based on the info? Well, safer is relative, but based on regulatory status, mm -hmm. ivermectin has FDA approval for specific human uses. That means its safety for those uses has been formally evaluated. Right. Fenbenzol lacks that FDA approval for humans, so its safety profile in people just isn't well established through rigorous trials, despite some off-label use. So from a documented approved standpoint, Ivermectin has the clearer pathway for human use in specific cases. Got it. And availability. Can you just buy these over the counter in the U.S.? For human use, no. Ivermectin requires a prescription. Finvendazole is available over the counter, but typically labeled and sold for animal use. Okay. The source also briefly mentioned natural alternatives. Yes. Things like pumpkin seeds, garlic, black walnut hulls. It notes they might offer some mild support, maybe preventative. But not a replacement for serious infections. Exactly. The source is clear. They aren't as reliable or potent as the pharmaceutical options for treating established infestations. Right. And finally, sourcing. This is always a practical question. The material actually talks about best sources and prices, even names an online pharmacy, mgpills.com. It does, and it lists claims made by them. Guaranteed quality, low prices, fast U.S. shipping, customer support. And it gives specific price comparisons, too. Fenbendazole, 222 milligrams, 10 tabs for $10 versus $25, $35 average. Ivermectin, 12 milligram, 10 tabs for $4.20 versus $30, $45. And Ivermectin paste for livestock, $9 versus $10, $20. Those are some significant differences. They are. But, and this is absolutely critical, the source itself includes a major disclaimer right alongside this information. Which is? That all the content is informational only. Mm -hmm. It is not a substitute for professional medical advice. Always consult the licensed healthcare provider before starting any medication. The source explicitly states it doesn't offer medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment itself. That disclaimer is key, especially when considering online sources or off-label uses. Paramount. Your health decisions need professional input always. Okay, so let's try to wrap this up. We've dug deep into fenbendazole and ivermectin. Clearly, both are effective anti-parasitic drugs. Mm. Each has its own niche, its own strengths, applications ranging from, you know, everyday pet care to the specific approved human uses, and even touching on this provocative cancer research angle. And I think the single most important thing for you, the listener, to take away is that choosing between them, or any treatment really, it's complex. Yeah. It depends so much on the specific situation, the infection, who's being treated, animal or human, you absolutely need to talk to a qualified vet or doctor to make informed choices for individual needs. Couldn't agree more. Professional guidance is non-negotiable. Absolutely. And maybe a final thought to leave people with, building on that cancer research angle, even though it's early days, it does make you wonder, doesn't it? How will a medical world continue exploring drug repurposing, finding new uses for existing drugs? It's a fascinating area. Yeah. What could this kind of research mean for future breakthroughs? not just for parasites, but maybe for other complex diseases, it really highlights how much we're still learning and how vital rigorous science is to validating these potential new paths. Well said. Continuous discovery and careful validation, that's the path forward.